Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Season 3 of the Audiobook Club with John York, a podcast celebrating every aspect of audiobook production and the surrounding industry. The Audiobook Club is sponsored by Amplify Audiobooks by Pro Audio Voices. To hear more about the phenomenal movements Amplify Audiobooks is making for independent authors in the audiobook space, you can find a direct link in the bio of this episode, as well as a short but informative advertisement within this interview. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we're so lucky to be joined by voice actor and legendary romance narrator Shane East. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. How are you today? <laughs> uh, just being legendary, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, that's, a, that's a tall order to live up to. Um, <laughs> but thanks. Thanks for the intro. I also like your podcast <laughs> voice. You know, we all have different voices for for work and for different yeah. things so i kind of like we were talking for a few minutes before and then i like how you launch into uh you know oh, the showtime ma- great uh so- <laughs> man it's a disease i can't help it <laughs> so um yeah no thanks it's lovely i'm doing well it's uh well it's not that early actually it's 10 30 here for me in the morning um and yeah my day is just beginning I'll be jumping in the booth later Fantastic. So, well, I really want to ask you about your uh, your, your process and, the, and how uh, you schedule your day a little bit later on, if that's okay. But mm. first, um, as is tradition on the show, I'd love to start with a huge question. Um, how did you like first find yourself voice acting and narrating audiobooks? Like, how did this all start for you? Um, well, I'll be succinct. It started because I was always I was always an actor. Went to drama school, did the whole shebang, did theatre musicals. So a bit of TV, a lot of TV commercials, et cetera. And then um, ended up, I just kind of, I don't know, I was just, I had an interest in voiceover. And so I started to do a little bit in the UK, but I found the UK um, scene quite tricky to get into. Uh, mm. Voiceover in general, I mean, I wasn't even looking at audiobooks. Um, but so that started my journey. So I did a few bits and pieces, but I, I found it a little bit um, tricky. So in general, that's kind of to broaden my horizons. I moved to the States anyway. Um, and then when I was here, uh, some years in, I just I had a friend who was at William Morris voiceover and she hooked me up. And uh, again, like I say, it was it's a little it was a little bit different here. People were willing to sort of um, which isn't to rag on the UK too much, but they were just mm. the, like a big agency like that were like okay cool like what what do you have so i had some demos and stuff and i had a few little jobs and they were like great yeah come you know we'll we'll take you on on so and so's recommendation and all that stuff so i started the mm. journey of voiceover um and did some good stuff with them and then it was actually myself i saw a um you know just a, a an audition a thing a request for british voices i didn't even know what it was for whom it was for exactly but i was like yeah i want to pursue voice more uh, and it turned out to be random house um because mm-hmm. they have studios in uh, la um and then i uh just went in did a they called me in for a sample read a sample um wasn't sure if it was if i was doing the right thing um mm. because i hadn't really done books uh and i've told this story before so i'll keep it brief but the guy who went in before me was uh quite a bit older and he sort of i could hear him through the studio door a little bit and he was very sort of you know the wind howled and i just thought <laughs> oh, i kind of went in i thought i don't think that's really my style so i don't know if i'm too it's right uh but i found out later that the producer was like she said no 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 we we were looking for what you were giving out not necessarily that so yeah and then they it was six months later that they um called me up and you know being the actor i was back then i expected i just had to audition again for something i thought okay cool so they're calling me up emailing me to to read you know, to read something else and I'll see if that one sticks, you know. But she was like, no, 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 yeah. we we put you on, like, we liked you. Uh, we just, you know, this is now one of the producers is, thinks your voice would be good for this. And so, and that, I went in and did the job and it was all about the human brain. Um, and I thought I was going to die because it was 
so heavy <laughs> in terms of uh, just the text it was you know it was scientific yeah. um it was interesting but for a first book it was a bit of a baptism of fire um and then i did a few non-fictiony that kind of thing i guess the british voice often lends itself to that um yeah and then after that, like, I think it was my third book. So it took a few months and then they put, pulled me in again for something. And it just went from there. And then they gave me a fiction book and uh, like a fantasy fiction. And that was kind of, I said, like, this is more my thing. I mean, I like nonfiction, but I didn't want to be doing nonfiction all the time. So hmm. that just started the journey. And it was a slow process because I was still doing all the other stuff. And But I thought, oh, great. You know, I get to go and do this they're pretty flexy with schedules if i needed to go to an audition or whatever they you know we could mix and match it with the studio time and so that was really how yeah. my journey began um and then yeah. it went from there oh fantastic so like we because like you know narrating an audio because you know is is, is very different from other other forms of voiceover work mm. um and it can be you know incredibly uh tedious at times it can be a <laughs> lot you know long hours and all things like that was it quite like a shock to the system when you were doing that first one i'm guessing the material <laughs> was I, I wouldn't even want to know the pronunciation guide <laughs> on, <laughs> on a book about the brain um but like was it a little bit of a shock to the system Oh uh, yeah, completely. I mean, I, I thought I don't, I don't think this is for me. That's my was my honest take on it after doing it. Mm. But you know, back then being a starving <laughs> police <laughs> can I have some more actor? Uh, yeah. I you know was it was I was like I'll do it. But uh, yeah, the first the first couple did uh, not sit that well with me in terms of I was just so exhausted from it. it the mental capacity it took um mm. to sit there and concentrate and to make it try and make it make sense and sound interesting and come alive and it was just yeah um yeah i did i didn't think i would do it if someone had told me you will end up doing this all the time and the way it's panned out i would tell them fuck yeah. off you know like, yeah. absolutely yeah. not like that's madness um but yeah but it just kind of i think it's a brain it's a brain thing you know the more you do it something ticks it does for me clicks in in certain parts of the brain and your ability to to read ahead and uh, to bring the i don't know it's just it's like every job it's kind yeah. of the experience you have to keep doing it in order to really perfect it um and it just did i you know luckily kept doing it and like i said fiction made a difference getting to yeah. play all the characters and bring the story and then it felt more like like the uh, the, the the theater of voiceover for me um yeah that's what it started to feel like and i was like okay cool it's a hard it's a hard job but i like the reward and i like doing all of these different things and when you get a really good story and the journey you go on so it kind of fulfilled that actor part of me yeah yeah I really resonate with that you know because I, I started off doing some non-fiction right at the start myself and um people around me were saying like oh you must be like you know because I read a lot of non-fiction in my spare time mm. and they were saying like oh you this must be like a dream come true because you can be like learning all the way I don't know about you but like five minutes after I'm out of that booth everything I've just said has just left my brain are you able to retain <laughs> like anything that you read because I've been asking this question to um narrators on this podcast and I've only as of yet after i mean i've had about 80 narrators on this show uh to date and i've only interviewed one person who said they can retain information from the non-fiction books that they've narrated yeah well that person's a liar um <laughs> so i don't know who they are <laughs> um yeah i don't i retain very little of i have read i should be incredibly well read for all the things I've read in that, like in the nonfiction realm um, or biography, et cetera. But it, yeah, you're right. I I think I retain, there have been a few books. There was a book called Why 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 You Sleep or Why We Sleep. Um, that, and I did retain that because I actually think I went over again some of the points of like what you should do and shouldn't do, et cetera, with sleeping. Um, so I did retain that because I had a real keen interest and I went back over it and we read but yeah if I just kind of like you if I read it prep it um look through it and 
then just record it. Even though I'm saying every single word and at the time it's all making sense and great, it totally just disappears as soon as I'm on to the next chapter or whatever, like, or a day. The next day it's all gone, I think. Uh, <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> I think it's you have some, your brain just, just does, it's like, it's not going in the right part the learning part it's maybe going in the doing part or something i'm not sure yeah yeah so am i right in saying that um most of the work uh that you were narrate in audiobook uh terms uh, most of the work that you got is recorded in a home studio is that is that correct yeah yeah i started in studio um back in the day but then um yeah many years ago i moved over to home studio because it was just the way everything was going really um, yeah so with you with you starting and having those first experiences you know with people around you're in a studio with with, with uh, other technicians etc um how does that how did that kind of affect your working process having that home studio was it because there's so many you know suddenly you can stop when you want you you don't have to you know communicate with other people if you want to start a little bit later or whatever you know you're totally on your own did that change your your process or did you find any difference in in you know how how that work kind of felt for you recording at home yeah i mean to a degree i mean i will say i was i was lucky i do feel lucky that i got to work with different directors at random house and that was my beginning that started me off um I think that's a very that's a very privileged start into this industry, which I don't think is available to many people now. Um, but the practicalities of it, moving over into home studio, yeah, I mean, I guess the main factor at the stage that I did it, I didn't I didn't get a lot of feedback. I would say from people a bit, but not um, you know directors saying I don't think that's going to work or whatever. Um, it was at that stage, it was kind of more, I would work with a lot more technicians. And so they would just kind of like be doing the tech side. And then if I had a question, I'd be like, what do you think of that? Then we would bounce it back. But so I guess that kind of element of it was, it was, I was already on my own at that point and that was fine. Um, mm -hmm. But it was the, it's the discipline. I mean, that's the real thing. You've got to, <laughs> you're right. Like you can, you could start at midday if you want, uh, but you've still got, uh, you know, <laughs> seven hours or you've got to take some breaks or and yeah if you take longer breaks uh it's it's good to have the flexibility but like any self-employment in that respect then you have to be on it and you have to be disciplined um to get your shit done basically yeah so i guess that was yeah. that was the biggest thing and i learned that i had to figure out how many pages i needed to do each day and so fine if i wanted to work from lunchtime to dinner, like to after dinner and do a late one, I could do it. But I had to get 65, 70, 75 pages done of this book tomorrow. Otherwise, you're fucked. Like, so I kind of mm. had to switch that mentality on. But the actual, I mean, I guess one thing I will say is also the technical side. I did have to learn that, um, which was a bit of a bugger. It's like a whole new world, isn't it? Um it's like taking on like a whole new skill or even set of skills. Um, I, that was a, a part, I, I was lucky myself because my sister's a, um, a, a, an editor and um, an engineer, a sound engineer. So I was lucky to have her. Um, but I must admit, I still struggle with that side of it. I think that I've, I'm, you know, I enjoyed the narration side. I enjoyed the creative side, if you will. Um, but then the tech side always does let me down still to this day. That was the biggest learning curve, I think uh yeah i guess for me i yeah that that one didn't i gloss over that a bit because i was also again lucky in terms of i had a i had a series that came in um and it was backlist um for a publisher and it was like it was long so they were happy to just keep doing it keep doing one a month kind of thing or whatever they we fitted it into my schedule and that was when i had the i got the home studio and they were happy for me to be at a studio. So basically I managed to sort of pull it together that the tech guy would come to me in my new studio uh, and mm. he would work with me. So it was set up to have somebody set up for two, like me in the inside, I can work by myself or I can have someone also control from the outside, et cetera. Um, yeah. So we kind of did that. And so I learned a bunch that way. And then he would be quite helpful 
uh, at times when I were doing it by myself and I would have a bad, you know, it's midnight and I can't, I don't know why it's not working, you know? Yeah. So yeah, kind of, I think that's the thing you have to have, you, you paid your sister, but you have to have somebody available, even if it's someone you pay, I think you have to have that backup when you start doing it from home. Yeah. You're like, so you don't just send yourself insane because trying to figure it out via the internet for something like Pro Tools, which is a software I use, I mean, good luck. Good luck with those forums <laughs> and stuff. I have no clue. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with you on that front. But now it's sort of once it got into a groove, I, I, I kind of figure. And even over the years, though, I would figure out. I'd realize that I had shortcut keys on my keyboard that I use, mm. but then some of the other numbers do something else, and so they would stop me being able to do something if I accidentally hit them. And then it took yeah. that sort of shit is what is you're going insane because you're like, what is different? Uh, and so I've had to, I've had those meltdowns and then had to figure it out and all of that shit. So yes, you're right in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> I, f I feel you on that one. Um, so your work in the, in the romance space is mm. of course adored by so many. Like was romance a fit for you? Like straight away? Did you, did you feel that connection with it or was it, or was it a, a slow build? Mm. Yeah, it wasn't, I didn't set out to do it. Uh, I was, yeah, I was doing my, uh, all my other stuff. I did a lot of YA because as Steve, um, so, um, and thrillers and all sorts. And I, and I do still love those, but, um, yes, it was a publisher. It was Simon and Schuster, I believe, who I worked with a lot and they had a romance book. They had these, I think, Anna Todd, they've been made into movies now, but, um, I forget the names, but, um. But yeah, they they asked me if I would if I would do it, and they kind of asked me in a sort of, uh, do you, you know, do you mind doing romance sort of way, um, which is interesting now. It's funny. I I think um, I mean, we can touch on that later. The attitudes towards romance, uh, the genre in general, from from sometimes from people, but uh, yeah, and I was like, okay, okay, sure, you know, I'll I'll give it a whirl. Um, but and then I guess. Uh, and then I did a Rain Miller, which was kind of this London bodyguard type bloke. <laughs> and I think those two books uh, seem to do something for people. Um, and then I just started to get offered more. Um, and that's how, and again, it's kind of a bit like my whole book career. It kind of, I didn't necessarily think, yeah, I want to, I want to do that genre or I want to specialize. Uh, it just sort of started to take off. And then I realized how sort of voracious, you know, the the romance side is, how many, you know, authors. There. And then I, you know, and then I just started to get more and more involved in it. But it was a, it was a slow burn for me at first because it wasn't this, it wasn't something I was seeking out. Um, but now, you know, obviously now is a whole different story. Yeah. You mentioned attitudes towards romance there. And it mm. is certainly something that, um, you know, that, that does come up quite a lot. But in my experience more recently i don't know if it's just because i've changed who i'm hanging out with but more um more recently yeah people have been you know sort of it doesn't seem as kind of taboo maybe if that's the right word as it maybe was um you know a few years ago have you found that have you found it kind of i don't want to say being accepted because of course it was always was accepted but there did seem from a certain type of person the certain type of narrator even to it, 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 romance sort of had that little bit of a you know people look down on it yeah um and i don't and i actually don't find i actually think that it's become you know because it's so popular and the amount of projects that are open to people you know is quite vast um i, I think it may have even flipped completely um i don't know what what is your experience with that yeah when i first started i think there was a bit of snobbery really around mm. the genre and you know i can even maybe guilty of that a little bit myself you know because my concept of it was either sort of you know some historical with you know and uh, a drawn uh, you know post like cover was a lady in a you know corset and stuff and some yeah. sort of man bending her over you know to kiss her and you know, it's either that sort of thing, I thought, which, great, those books are wonderful, but, um, or Jackie Collins, you know, which was on my mum's shelf. 
um, yeah. growing up or Daniel Steele was that the other one there was a few um Jilly Cooper is very British yes yes so yeah. you know and there was so there's always that sort of like oh that's naughty that's naughty that one um <laughs> I feel like there was that so it ran the gamut from that sort of like well that's a bit cheeky through to like oh well that's not proper literature is it sort of thing um mm. and I do think I've seen definitely a change in attitudes uh, yeah the last I can't really give you a timeline but maybe the last five five plus years um just I don't know if that's like a general consensus across the board um but or just the the proliferation of it the terms of I think romance is the highest grossing grossing genre or it was last year or the year before something like mm. that I know there was some t statistic so I have I have seen that and I think I've seen it even publishers maybe are doing more than they used to um some sort of like big publishers doing maybe a bit more than they used to um you know because I think 50 shades was the one where uh, like that was a random house and I think they realized just how much money they could make I can't speak for them but like that was just my assumption on it because it mm. blew up and that did kind of spur a whole sort of um you know slew of people or just maybe it was just more out in the consciousness you know what I mean so mm -hmm. I just think it's a, I think it's maybe a twofold it's money talks in my opinion <laughs> so yeah if you can people you know publishers company know that there's money to be had there then that you know there's like much more acceptance of it and then just in general just people I think are more like open to it or more intrigued by it more interested in it and more open about the fact that they they love it and they read it you know yeah audible's running yeah. all those why romance ads on social media and stuff at the minute about how great it is and how the stories are and i think also there's a, there is just a lot of i think you could if you before you head into it you can have a feeling that it's not like i said oh that's just you know it's just there for the smut or something you know um mm. which once you get into it like it really runs the gamut and there's just some i do some my most difficult acting in romance books. I think it's maybe the most, it's certainly the most vocal fan base that I've I've come across, especially on social media. Um, and you know, and when you literally have those, you know, literally have thousands of people making videos, you know, tweeting or whatever, um, their love for like this genre, of course, it's gonna it's gonna ramp up the interest, and and then there's got to be somebody supplying that demand so I, I do think it's um it's quite incredible actually i think yeah i think that's a good point with the with social media as well over the last um like 10 years really it does it gives it gives everyone a platform to shout about what they like and love and to build tribes or whatever and you're right i do think mm. the fact of you know people are out, out there loving on all these books and loving on so all types of you know um the why choose books the you know mm books you know um all of that like all the different preparations it's kind of just like it's not it's out there and yeah you know, if you see a lot of people love that well i love that too like there's i think it just takes that sort of like oh well i read those you know but i don't tell anyone about those that's sort yeah of vibe yeah yeah, I was talking to Teddy Hamilton about this very subject um, on a previous episode, and he said um, that he thinks that you know that it gives what these books do and what, what romance as a genre does is it, it gives people a safe space to explore these themes and you know adventures really that they don't have you know they they don't necessarily they're not able to maybe talk to many people about or maybe you know maybe haven't. Um, you know, had those conversations, and then they're given a, a safe space within that story to to explore, and and I think that that, that really resonated with me. And I thought it's, um, I mean, that's got to be a positive, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's you know, it's same with all literature. It's kind of or, you know, a lot of literature. It's a, it is mm. a it's a space to it's fantasy. You know, it's a place mm. to completely immerse yourself in something different. Um, you know, with your own imagination, using the words on the page, and so I agree. I think, yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. for a lot of people, romance takes them to a place uh, that can be can be adjacent to their life. You know, mm -hmm. small town romance, boy meets girl, blah, blah, all the way through to <laughs> you know, sex on a foreign planet with 
with alien <laughs> whatever yeah. your thing is you know have at it. <laughs> it's, it's true it's out there for you <laughs> yeah yeah. So speaking of those uh, vocal uh, fan bases, you, of course, have an amazing group of followers and fans uh, on sh- uh, social media, the Shaniacs. Yeah. First of all, like, who came up with that name? Because I love that name. Well, yeah, I can't remember. So I'm not going to say because someone, um, I think someone told me recently that it was them and then someone else, <laughs> someone else said that someone else gets <laughs> props for it, but it wasn't, it was so-and-so. So I stay out of all of that dialogue. I'm sure okay, someone okay. else will tell you, but um, yeah, it's one of the early people. I actually, it's not a group that I uh, have any involvement in, in, in terms of the administration of, or I'm not a member yeah. of it. It's just, I guess my work became the impetus for that particular Facebook group um to sort of evolve really and so over the yeah. last, so many years i don't know i mean i think they're three i think we just had they had their third birthday um this last year but i'm probably wrong and yeah. I'll, I'll probably get comments because <laughs> i get most of those kind of details wrong um yeah but yeah that's that's one that's one avenue and then obviously i have you know there's other people um on instagram and stuff that aren't part of the shaniacs but the shaniacs do a lot of yeah. a lot of interesting stuff and bits and pieces um, yeah that's it's, it's fantastic you know I, I, i'll be scrolling through tiktok procrastinating uh, when i should be recording mm. and i'll just come across like a, a, a book review from a, a book talker or whatever um and notice that they're waving the kindle in the hand and on the kindle they have a shane east sticker ah. um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's that, that's pretty cool. It must make you feel like oh, look, but my work's being appreciated. You know, all that hard work's paying off. People are enjoying it. Yeah, I think that's the. I mean, that's what's also enticing about the romance genre, and that's why I have a, a lot of respect for it, um, mm-hmm. and have delved into it so much. Um, yeah, because the the like you said, the people are very the vocal. The fans are very engaged. They want to. Um, they want to tell you one about the book that they you know that took them on this journey they love knowing the authors they love knowing us uh and it is it is nice because it's sort of you know a lot of other stuff sometimes you're sort of it's just into the void you know Mm -hmm. you you know that you're doing well i guess if you just keep working a lot or uh, but you know with with romance i found people are like you said, like they want to follow you, they want to know what's going on. They, they, you know, they want to comment on stuff. They want to put out little TikToks, and your name kind of gets out there more and more. Um, and it's it's lovely. It's lovely to get feedback from people mm. and realize. And you know, I have I do get messages and emails and things saying, you know, how certain books in particular and performances have um, have really had an impact and in quite a. Mm. You know, in quite a, a deep way, sometimes for some people, it's just helped them get through, you know, a difficult time from, I mean, I've had somewhere, someone had to go th- through sort of cancer therapy and yeah. would take the books, you know, the audio books, you know, she said just enabled her to get through it, like to to listen and to do all these these things. And other people who've had yeah. death in the family and stuff, they just sort of, it's been their reprieve and it's been a lifeline. And so... You kind of don't really realize that sometimes I think with other stuff, how impactful it can be. You just think, you know, oh, that was really great or that's entertaining or, you know, hopefully someone enjoys that. But it, it can really have an effect on people's lives in a, in a different way that I had no idea until I got into romance and got the feedback from people. That is amazing. And and how beautiful for them to, to reach out and let you know, because, mm. you know, I mean, that is, um, yeah, it's absolutely incredible. Is social media something that you do set out time to, you know, plan or prefer, uh, prepare for? Is it something that you get on with? Are you are you a social media guy? <laughs> well, I don't prepare for it. If you've seen my Instagram, you'll know. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I do put out things. I mean, I I I think in this day and age, uh, you have to. Um, I think if you're public figure in some kind of way and i don't use that in a grandiose fashion i just mean if you're sort of in the public eye in some respects small or big then social i think is it's it's important so and i've you know i was later to the game i kind of i got on twitter later i 
kind of was a bit sort of old school about it, I think, at the beginning. But I've grown to to really love it. And since the since the kind of demise of Twitter <laughs> as it was yeah. once was, uh, which I grew to love because I just used to love like putting out little bits and pieces. Um, I've uh, totally uh, fallen in love with Instagram. I just I I like the stories you can share. I like seeing what other people again, it's kind of I also I do see a lot of what people say and I do see a lot of their own little stories and stuff coming up on my feed and then throwing out videos and I, I yeah I think I just I really do enjoy it TikTok I'm still trying to get to grips with but um but I I think it's essential and I think you have to learn you have to find the way that works for you because the same with anything I think at first I felt I had to do it maybe back in the day um and I had a certain idea about it and I was like oh god I don't even have time to do that but now it's kind of I I found the way that works and it's fun and I think a big part of it is people just want to People want to connect with you and see you, like whether you're talking about your work or whether you're just, I don't know, you're boiling an egg and you know what I mean? It's just, <laughs> as long yeah. as, you know, as long as you, your personality, really, I think people love that. That's what I've learned from it. And then, you know, if you're being yourself on there, then it can be, it can be a who I have a, I have a good old laugh. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was I was shocked with the sort of boom of TikTok, especially with narrators, um, and uh, because there's there's just a really wonderful community on there um, of uh, narrators of you know every genre, ever, just everything all coming together and, and and sharing funny stories and talking about process and giving advice and things. I think it's wonderful. Mm. Um, so this brings me to this is uh, the the most asked the most requested question that i ask guests and i know um that there will be a huge amount of people who would like it if i asked you also um is there a piece of advice that you would give to an aspiring narrator voice actor um who is beginning their journey in 2024 um <laughs> well okay i would say a couple of things it is I feel it's a little uh, bit the Wild West at the minute. Um, you know, we all know about mm -hmm. AI things happening and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's just my first uh, little, not a caveat, but it's just a little sort of thing. Um, and I think in terms of that, and I think this for myself, it's also sort of thinking about if you're getting into it, what you want to do and where this industry is going, which is kind of difficult to say. Um, mm -hmm. So those two things. And if you really think it's for you and you really want to do it um my advice my biggest advice i'd say would be to really um study it first and foremost um mm. i would listen to people who do a really great job of it like and you can you know you see all the names out there etc um and then you need to start and i would i would advise somebody to also work with someone to some degree like start to lay some stuff down and work with someone to kind of be taught about the pitfalls of just the performance um because it's not i think some people just think oh i have a nice voice and i'm i can act and whatever there's just a lot more to it so it kind of those would i mean that would be my biggest thing is i would honestly delve in and listen to really good people and listen to the genres you like because they're different you know mm -hmm. a kind of zippy romance book is performed differently to maybe a dark thriller or something mm -hmm. you know um and find and spend some time finding your voice uh that's good um because i've seen it with people the best thing i think you can do is to come into the industry uh so that if you send me for example because uh, you know i have a production company if you send me something and you're new to me but you have a bunch of samples because you've gone away and you've you know worked with someone a bit you've researched it you've you know you've done the thing that you and i have done which is i did it a lot by trial and error as well like i was working with a director mm -hmm. and i was in the booth and i spent so many hours doing that so if you put in some of that work and you're really keen and you send me stuff then i it would impact me differently or impact any kind of producer differently um than if you send something where you're like well that's yeah i can hear that they've got a good voice i can hear that it's there but it's not you know what i mean it's not mm, as yeah. it's not quite there 
yet you know you want someone you want a newbie to be like i would say companies want a newbie like if you've got a podium or whatever they want to be gripped by it and be like oh that's a good voice oh that's a good actor okay great mm. like they've already got their things in place then you know and they're new yeah so that's that's great and then you can then you get on the run because it's it's very there's a lot of competition you know why is someone gonna give you a a chance or start with you when there's other people who have already been doing it for several years, they're going to give you a chance if you've already, if you've got that something, you know what I mean? And you've, yeah. you've worked on it. So that's really my thing. I would just, you know, take the time to find your voice and get yourself into it that way. And some people are brilliant, you know, some people have the knack. Um, I, I remember Stella Hunter, um, mm. when she was beginning, only some certain amount of years ago now, um, but she did exactly that. She knew she knew romance books well um, already. She listened to a lot of audio, and then her journey started with going to certain narrators, myself and, and Andy, I think some other people, and she did some sessions with everyone, and so and took advice from everybody about what she would kind of maybe needs to work on or whatever. And I mean, I, you can see the results. Like she's yeah. Yeah. yeah, and she's got the natural talent for it. But I will tell you, when we did our sessions at the beginning, yeah, there was still, like, she was still finding, I would say, finding her voice around certain things and certain elements, you know, the you know the more explicit stuff can be tricky. Doing the opposite mm -hmm. sex voices can be tricky. Like, take some time to finesse some of that. But mm -hmm. that's my, my biggest advice. Just don't jump in and, you know, you know do the homework before you launch yourself try and launch yourself into it because it will i think it will behoove you so much more to make an impact yeah. um straight off the bat absolutely i think that's fantastic advice um and you're right there is a maybe a maybe a social media led mentality of, of just wanting it like right now you know like seeing somebody on, online who does it thinking that looks really cool i want to do it i want to be a pro by tomorrow um yeah and, uh, and you have yeah. to spend time you know spending time in the booth you know i've had other people that i i know that i've worked with actually who then started at home you know and um, one girl she kind of asked me a few things about working for me she'd already been narrating but the other thing with her was that she was just so loved narrating and that's also shows so she was then spending at home she was kind of spending a bunch of hours in the booth um you know, working on stuff. Again, it's kind of, mm. it's the thing that I was lucky enough to get paid to do. Um, but nowadays, if I was starting out, I'd I'd have to do that myself and I'd have to, I'd spend that time and also spending time in the booth recording. Um, and I know some people might not have a home studio, but I believe in America anyway, SAG used to allow you to go into a studio. But um, what even if you're just kind of sat somewhere recording, it, you don't have, it doesn't have to be record quality. But to know that you do want to sit there and mm. read this thing, <laughs> read 500 <laughs> pages of a fantasy novel or whatever it is, or if you really want to do romance, you want to do it. Like, I think that's the other thing. Sometimes uh, you've, you've really got to know that that's for you as well. And that, to me, is all part of the homework. So that when you launch in, then you are really excited. And I can tell that from people when they kind of start, you know, emailing me or whatever. Like I'm newer, yeah. but I did, I've done this and that, and I'm you know I've reached out to these people, and I'm really uh, they I can just they're like hungry for it, and it's that's great. That's the kind of person you want to work for because they're really invested. Um, yeah, that makes a big difference too. Yeah, absolutely. Moving on uh, to maybe a question that's slightly left field, um, and I apologise in advance because uh, this question is hated uh, by <laughs> uh, by previous guests. Um, but nonetheless, uh, what is a question that you wished you were asked more? Uh -huh. Can you do this comedy book, Steve? Shame. <laughs> that's a question I would love to be asked. About. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm going to keep it <laughs> work specific. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I would love people to uh, to ask me to ask me that rather than yeah. I mean, you know, I love all the other stuff, but I would love that question uh, to be thrown at me uh, all the time because I love I love comedy books, I love rom coms, I love anything mm. with like humor and 
sarcasm mm. and all of that stuff. So if people would ask me that question, I'd be thrilled. If there's, I don't think there's another like a broader question in my life if I would want to be asked more often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do people say to that? Oh, all sorts of stuff. Mostly, it's things like, um, "Can I pay you more?" or something, you know, on the along those lines. Um, <laughs> but we've had some really good ones. Um, I'll have to make a little, um, you know, collection of them, compilation of them, or something, uh, and put it online. But there's, so um, with like comedy, then, so like, are we are we talking like you know an audio book, but like maybe like a first person like a funny character? Maybe it's, I'm, the thing that springs to mind now is like the Mordecai novels. I always thought they'd be just amazing to narrate. So witty, <laughs> so full of you know so you know the pg woodhouse style um, right you know well i love i yeah it's anything really and i, I i've done uh, i've done them over the years um that kind of that dry sarcasm um i did a book called um the chronicles of between which is a big it's about 30 odd hours long and it's split first half is the girl second half is the guy it's fantasy and it's kind of mm. monty python humor um mm. you know with these quirky characters um very dry comments constantly uh that's kind of what uh i mean and i did another one yeah. i did a uh, nick spaulding he's dumped actually i did years and years and years ago and again i loved all of that it's it's real just it's the dry british sarcasm um which i found in america like, in american authors too um some of them kind of play that up um but that that's really what I, I love uh, that. I'm not, I don't, not, I'm not so familiar with your references. That's why I have to go to the ones that I'm um, done. Um, but uh, yeah, that kind of thing. Off the wall stuff and always that those dry comments that's just very British. I just yeah, fucking love absolutely. that stuff. It's talking about like, fa like favourite sort of character types you know um to sort of play i i'm always just drawn to like the more sarcastic i just really enjoy playing dicks i think <laughs> because like if you can spend your morning just being awful <laughs> and, like, you know you come you come out like it's, it's sort of therapeutic i don't know <laughs> Well, yeah, anytime you get to be a bit completely different, probably to how you would be in, you know, real life, that can always be a joy, however that is. Um, yeah. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it's the sort of stuff, you know, Alan Rickman was like that. Uh, he just has that way, if you watch some of his films when he's funny, it's just that real deadpan sort of thing. Yeah. And I love, those are the kind of characters I just love. Because, um, yeah, you know, I don't necessarily get those in, I don't get those in romance that often. Sometimes to mm -hmm. a degree, but not so. Like, I just played the devil, the one, and that kind of, that had a lot of that sort of dry humour. And that was a romance yeah. book. Um, but, yeah, Alan Rickman is my sort of benchmark for that. <laughs> yeah utter dryness about things <laughs> <laughs> fantastic so we're not recording in the studio we're not in the booth what could we often find you up to <laughs> um well i well i guess la i'll go by last year last year it was either if i wasn't recording so i'm either i do like going to the gym that probably sounds super wanky but i do find that uh because I used to think that that was just part of life uh, in terms of not a, a part of it. Enjoy, do you know, like, not a hobby or something. Like, what do you enjoy outside of work? I'm like, I actually do really like going there. It just, because we sit in a box uh, for so much, or if, you know, if I'm doing production stuff, I'm at a laptop. So getting out there, that you can find me there for sure. At least uh, I try and go at least four times a week. And then, um, um otherwise yeah i just it's i'll get out and about like i'm very much a um you know catch up with friends dinner at their mm. place dinner at my place dinner out somewhere um or last year was a lot of trips like i would work like a bit of a lunatic in la and then i would mm. go off to different places um whether it was nashville for four days and then back or whether mm. it was over to europe in the summer like i did or uh, Mexico is easy for us in LA. I, it sounds like I live such an amazing, charmed life. I have to say, <laughs> for, uh, saying all of this stuff, I don't know. But but yeah, that was that was me last year. Was work hard, go away, and then when I'm in LA, just 
chill time with friends and the gym. So I don't do anything crazy. I'm not like skydiving off buildings. Uh, I don't have a, I don't do clay pottery on the side. <laughs> Something like that. I get a lot of my creativeness out in the booth. And then I feel like Yeah. just, you know, have a laugh and just ease into the rest of the stuff. Just chill. I hear people say, because oh, I work from home and I'm in charge of my own hours, you know, to the most degree, um, that I hear like, oh, it must be like, you know, you. I don't know how you ever start. I just stay in bed all day. And I actually think it's the opposite. I think out of fear, um, it's like I can often find myself doing, you know, being a, you know, in front of my computer or in the booth or whatever, 12 hours a day or, you know, sometimes even more if I'm editing or doing whatever. Um and I, I think that it's more difficult to actually take time off because you kind of, if, you, if you're working from home, you may sort of never be at work technically like in an office, but you're also never not at work because you, you live where you work, if that makes sense. So it's yeah. like, I always find that the most difficult part of it. Is it, it like, do you resonate with that at all? Yeah, because doing this, you're, um, you're an independent business effectively. Um, and so <laughs> any self-employed person, I've spoken to other people in different areas, uh, it is hard to switch off because I think um, what my own experience is, you know, there's the, you want to get the work when you're, you know, when your career is maybe not as, um, you know, established. So you kind of want, so there's always that, there's always that hunger to, you know, fill the calendar, get the job, get the next, like work with those people, blah, blah, blah. And then you kind of reach a certain point where you've kind of attained, I guess, a certain amount of that. Uh, and then, and I have had this conversation with other sort of well-known narrators that you, you guys would know that then there comes this balance act of, well, I'm still kind of, I've got a bit of a mindset of I've got to do everything I'm offered or I've got to be chasing everything, uh, you know. And so now I'm working six days a week and I have no life. And then you have to, that's, it's finding, it's, it's true. It's what you said. It's more finding the balance of work life, um, you know, in a kind of self-employed way and switching that part of your brain off that says, if you say no to something, then that's it. You know, you, you've, Fucked yourself. Your career is you're, you're still going to fall apart. It's just a very weird. I think, especially for us being coming from acting, creating. You know, we are actors still, but it's that that workspace is, is very. Uh, it's not sh assured. You know, books books are interesting because they are people want to book you ahead and all of that stuff. So it's it's. I think that's where the like I say the marrying of that security in lots of ways of being booked ahead of time etc but getting yourself booked so far ahead of time that you're just sending yourself crazy um mm -hmm. so i agree i don't i think it's the opposite of i couldn't imagine sitting laying in bed there's, there's too much to do and then <laughs> i find but i found myself i have to just make sure i schedule stuff I mean, I do really enjoy the job and I really don't mind working, you know, narrating during the day and then doing production either in the morning first and then again in the evening. I kind of, I, I do love it, but I also know for a healthy human being, you've got to go out and see people and have social interaction or be with family, friends, however it is for you. Um, so I find that I will schedule stuff like, you know, like certain amount of days. I've got these things I want to do and these are social things or whatever and stuff. And then, and then I will make sure then that means I'm not at home or I'm not, you know what I mean? I have a friend yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hanging out with someone, so I'm not going to carry on working. And that tends to, tends to be good for me. And then I'll schedule complete Sundays off where I'm just like, you're not doing anything today to do with mm. work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely more like that. There's a discipline and it can just over, you can just end up, doing it 24 7 can't switch yeah. off yeah absolutely no I, I couldn't agree more um you you really do have to find that balance i think it's like dealing with uncertainty as well maybe um sort of plays into that um i i, I can only speak for myself but then if you know if you um if you if you're not sure what you're going to be doing six months down the line it, it's that sort of fear of like, right, I need to book, I need to book things, I need to, you know, get churn things through and make sure that the money's coming in to save for those rainy days or whatever. Um, and just sort of operating out of fear. I think that leads back into um, you sort of <laughs> just, yes, yeah, it's, it's sort of working yourself into, into a frenzy. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting 
it's a it's an interesting mindset and i do think i do th i don't know about other businesses but i do think that is can be quite particular to to us or any kind of thing that is can be sporadic and you know acting mm -hmm. uh the backgrounds we come from is sporadic by nature like you have a you do a massive mm -hmm. commercial or you do some kind of thing or you're on some show or theater or whatever and then boom it's like oh like there's nothing for a couple of months and there you are trying to you know auditioning and meeting and all of that stuff and so i think yeah. yeah we have you can get still bring that into the book world which is structured differently um yeah and then you have that panic of like trying to book so far ahead or whatever and it's a real it can be a real mind fuck it's a nice problem to have i'm sure but uh <laughs> you know some people are probably thinking well that's that sounds lovely but um yeah, 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 you know, I definitely agree with what you're saying. So I'd love to just ask you one final question, uh, if that's okay. Um, and it's, uh, is there anything that you're working on right now that, that you know, you're looking forward to, uh, you know, that you, that's bringing you excitement or anything in the near future that you're looking forward to? Um, yeah, I think this year's, in, it's, I, I won't be s specific, but I'm, you know, I've been doing things outside of, um, the uh, the books so which is kind of nice and i've uh, you know video game stuff and whatnot so that's already kicked off this year um but and as far as books go um i'm also producing a bunch more which um n not stuff that i'm rating on um and i'm kind of enjoying that so again things i can't really say because they haven't been announced but um yeah, that was kind of like a, a a bit of a a desire for me for this year, um, and then I've got you know I'm, I'm obviously excited about all the other stuff I've got you know Jodie Ellen Malpaz I work with we've got her the American which is like a fourth book in Unlawful Men series which has great people on and so I get to produce that and beyond that and then so I'm you know and then we do a, a, the this woman series she did. Um, or this man was her original one that kind of made her famous and she's done it from the men's perspective and we're doing the third book coming this year so there's a lot of all of that stuff and which is lovely that's still kind of coming along um all the authors i'm working for but uh, yeah i'm kind of i'm excited about producing a bunch of stuff that i'm not narrating on um and also you know dipping out of the booth and going to studios and doing some other uh, non-book work but um which is happening and yeah so it's kind of it's a bit more variety this year uh and a little bit of time out of the booth but the time in the booth will be will be worth it um and then i'm open to seeing i don't personally don't book myself so so far ahead anymore so it also is kind of nice because it, it allows other things to come in um and so that's also what i'm, I'm kind of so it's a general theme I'm kind of excited for for having a bit of space um, in my schedule and being able to, you know, say yes to other things or, you know, look into other things. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. So watch your space. I'll let you know as the year pans out how that all, how that all goes. <laughs> but so far, so great. Well, brilliant. Well, that sounds fantastic. There's nothing better than variety. Um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to a close for this episode of the Audiobook Club and all of the links to Shane's social media platforms, merch collection and website will be linked in the show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in and of course, another huge, huge thank you to you, Shane, for joining us. Thanks so much. Cheers, thanks a lot. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them, and keeps you in the driver's seat. 
check it out at proaudiovoices.com. You'll find Amplify in the marketing menu.